Pues yo. Ang kinu yung brea, pa kahaman to, kaya yung mga kanit ay bitisa ang mga ka. Nasong chay lo, yung bari. Som krop lo patihin. ដោយសារក្នុងសព្ទនាការនៅក្នុងរសៀលនេះក្លាមជីកោតសម្គាល់ឃើញនឹងមានវត្តមានរបស់លោកស្រីអាន់តាគីសេដែលជាមេធវី
ហើយអង្គរសុំរៀបផងដែរថាក្រុមវិទ្យាវិទ្យាការពេក្តីនួនជាមានពេលវេលាកន្លះថ្ងៃគឺពេញមួយរសៀលនេះនៅក្នុង
จะพูดอาดับบุญนึกนอเซลเดเดปีอยสามสปีฟลัชมารอยบุ๋มไอชีรบายกาไดบันตะตงลางดอยกาญาลัยสหจักรมเสมอกัดโดยได้ลูกนุนชีบันมาเจรุยมหายถากาญาลัยมูนี่มีนพิบลำอิงขนมกาซึบองกัดไดลคอนโทรดอลกาเรียลไลซ์ฮะปรีญาสมตุไดลคอนโทรดอยกาเรียลไลซ์ฮะปรีญาลูกน้องรบายกาลบักลุนไอกซาเดใบอ้อยใบร้อยหกสิบปมบูนฟลัสสามสิบปมใบบางห้างเอาคืนกันแต่ชั่วแทมติดหาการยาไลซ์ฮะจะกรมเสพอังกฤษเพียยิมทุกการจีมวยการยาไลซ์ฮะบริญญาครองการดับบรรทุกหมกเลรูปคนกระไรลูกนุชีลูกลูกใส่จะกรมจิตติกรุบดำใบตะเตงระบายกาใส่ปีกำหนดอัตเสียนตีกันไหลเนสเซฟอังกฤษบานยงตัวตายตัวลือบกุลมรุปกุลูกตุวันนาริศได้กำปองบำราการในการยาไลซ์หะปริญญาลูกโตยวันรัฐบาลโจบำราการเงียขนงการยาไลซ์หะปริญญาตั้งปีการยาไลนี้บาทีเสพอังกฤษมองมาเลยเดิมนี่วิคมีนเอาไว้กู้อ้อยสังสายตีถ้ากดมีนมนูกุมวิจีแบบหะปริญญาเตาแต่เจ้าประกันจุนสังสายตายปนอบัดปีสาวอย่างยูรบกอดเนกาเรียไลประดิษฐ์ปริญญาจีมวยกอดอย่างปิดประกอดโครงการกูบังฮันแผ่นตีนี้หายเวียปิดจีมันเจงหมอกปีบัดพิซารบกลุ้นเนกครงระบบขมายกระหอมนุตีสุดปริญญาเดกมีการจมต่อปีสองสามเจลูกนำนางทาปริญญา Your Honours, uh, first of all, this is not a proper objection. Um, it does not fall within any of the grounds on which a document may be objected to at this stage. Your Honours have indicated clearly the, the prima facie standard for admissibility of documents it being prima facie relevance, reliability uh, and, and authenticity. Um, issues that my friend is now going to have nothing to do with that standard. Uh, they may ultimately go to wait that your honours may ascribe to individual documents. Um, additionally, in our submission, it is improper uh, for counsel to make submissions about the qualifications of individual uh, staff and to name them as such. Um, I don't think it's proper for that to be done in an you know, open setting, and certainly I, I can't recall a single instance where that's been, that type of practice has been engaged in this court. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 เมตวีนุนชีมันมันตัวตัวสกอลให้มันตัวตัวยกไอกซาเดลมันไตรระบบริญญาดิบจำไอกซานี่ยกมอกดักสามนาคาอันนี้การบัญชีตะปนังตีคุณสมบัติต่อติดบัสนลูกปฏิญอาณา
លោកតូចវណ្ណរិតបានចូលបំរើការងារនៅក្នុងគូបង្ហាញផែនទីនេះហើយវាពិតជាមិនចេញមកពីបទពិសោធន៍របស់ខ្លួននៅក្នុងរបបខ្មែរក្រហមនោះទេគាត់កើតនៅថ្ងៃ
It follows that there will be no examination of the implementation of policies other than those pertaining to the forced movement of the population, phases one and two. And I simply quote that language because I think it needs to take an overarching sort of standpoint in respect of this document here. And this needs to be the groundwork in which we're assessing all of the submissions today. So further, along those lines, I would repeat something that we have also previously submitted, and that's following the severance of case two, the central thread, the central thread of this first mini-trial is again, it's the alleged evacuation of Phnom Penh and the subsequent population transfer from the south to the north of the country. Little else, as we have said, little else is now relevant. And this chamber and the parties should adhere strictly, strictly to that central thread. As we've said, Nguyen Chia's position with respect to these issues is clear. He's made it clear. He will continue to make it clear. And we simply reiterate today that the co-prosecutors need to do little else in this case, apart from establishing that Nguyen Chia's actions with respect to those two issues, those two alleged population transfers, were not justified under international law. So therefore, it follows we submit that the chamber should adopt the exact same surgical approach it took in severing the case and crafting a modified indictment. It should apply that very approach to limit, to strictly limit the number of documents now is the time, as the chamber has rightly notified us, now is the time to separate the wheat from the chaff so that when it comes time down the road to debate the probative value of these documents, all of us, the chamber, all the parties, will be faced with a reasonable, limited, and practicable task, a task strictly in line with the terms of the severance order. I will now turn to the specific documents tendered by the parties. And if I may, let me begin today with the civil party submissions. I won't say much about the translation issue, which I believe we discussed this morning briefly, and I believe we made our position known already to the Chamber through the Tory Kripa by email last week. Uh, simply to reiterate, we do not object to the table of those documents for discussion today, but we do, however, reserve our rights to make any further submissions, if necessary, once those translations are finalized. And we, of course, acknowledge the translation difficulties experienced by everyone. Turning to the substance of these documents, uh, I, again, I, I start with these, I start with the civil party submissions today in light of what I've said earlier regarding relevance. Uh, I'm, I'm looking now at revised Annex 7A, and that was circulated last week and even prior to that. And this is a list of 10 specific documents, the 10 specific documents for debate today. And again, I, I begin with these because with a single exception of that being the last document on this list, it seems to me, and I, and I submit, that all of these documents, the first nine of the ten, are irrelevant to issues raised in case 002. That is to say, nine of the ten documents are clearly aimed at establishing the implementation of alleged PK policies other than, other than the population transfers. And this is apparent from a facial review of this annex, annex 7A, and indeed it is confirmed in the letter of the co-lead lawyers of 8 March in which they indicate that the 10 documents may not relate, I'm reading from the last page of this letter, may not relate to the scope of case 002-01, and I submit that they do not relate, they do not relate. With the exception, as I've said, of the last document, which clearly seems to go to the historical background, which, as we submitted at the end of the last session, is still open for debate, is still on the table, so to speak. So we do not object to that final document. 
So I am slightly confused as to their, which seems to be my natural state at these hearings, but I, I am slightly confused as to their inclusion on the list at all. But I'm sure we'll hear from my colleagues across the stage on that point later this week. Turning now to the OCP documents, again, I would just like to make some general points concerning the relevance of these documents. And today I'll be making reference to the various E109-4 lists. Those are the various annexes which are listed in the trial chamber's memo on the agenda today. And in particular, I'd like to point out that the submissions in general, in general, under their columns, headed description and points of the indictments on most, if not all, of these annexes. From a review of those submissions, it's apparent that a number, a large number, in fact, of the tender documents we say also fall outside the scope of K001, 002, Slash well, some of the documents are indeed clearly relevant to communication and administrative structure. A great number of them, again, as the civil party list, relate to the implementation of policies other than the single one that forms the basis of this first mini-trial. And again, it's a first forcible transfers. So we submit, we submit along these lines, the Chamber should take pains to exclude this extraneous material, lest it and the rest of us are left to deal with an unnecessarily unmanageable dossier at the end of the case. We urge the Chamber, given its positive obligation to manage these proceedings in an effective manner, to call and discard as many documents as possible, as many irrelevant documents as possible. And in this regard, we intend to give you some guidance. We intend to give you some guidance. But in order to avoid the tedium of going through every single document on each and every one of these lists, I'm going to make some general points. And at a later stage, probably first thing tomorrow morning, I will circulate to the parties in writing the indication of precisely the documents on each of those lists that we suggest fall outside the scope of case 002, and the OCP then may make any submissions in response. I will, as I just said, make some general Remarks regarding the various categories, and I'll take these in turn. And I'll begin with A6, those are the DK biographies. And this is, of course, further to the comments of Major Sanarun just a few moments ago. It is our position that these documents, these biographies, need to be treated as, in the same manner, me, as confessions. They are clearly, or were clearly made under torture, the threat of torture, or in any event, some type, some type of inducement or coercion prohibited by Rule 21.3. And accordingly, they should be treated like confessions. And as my colleague mentioned, that is to say that they should be considered prima facie torture-tainted, and therefore subject to the Chamber's previous ruling with respect to the use of such material. And this perhaps for the benefit of the public and for all of us, in fact, I would just like to read briefly from the ruling made some time ago by both the President and Judge Cartwright. This is from Case 1, the trial transcript of 20 May 2009, at page 6. And this is the President speaking. The parties are reminded of Article 15 of the Torture Convention, which says each state party shall ensure that any statement which is established to have been made as a result of torture shall not be invoked as evidence in any proceeding except against the person accused of torture as evidence that the statement was made. And this is the general position we're familiar with this. But I'll leave it at that. Judge Cartwright then a few days later went on to expand a bit on this. And now I'm reading from, again, case 001, trial transcript 28 May 2009, at page 9. And again, this is Judge Cartwright. The Chamber wishes to emphasize the importance of the fact that the Court is bound by the provisions of Article 15 of the Torture Convention. Additionally, she noted this provision is reflected in Article 38 of the Cambodian Constitution and also in Article 21.3 of the Internal Rules, which states, 
no form of inducement, physical coercion, or threats thereof, whether directed against the interviewee or others, may be used in the interview. In practice, Judge Carr, I will say, this means that the fact that a confession has been made and that it was made under torture is an admissible fact. However, and this is the important point, the contents of a confession cannot be accepted as a truthful statement. If Judge Cartwright continued, any party who wishes to refer to the truthfulness or otherwise of the contents of that confession, it will be necessary first to establish that the confession made under torture or the threat of torture. So further to what Major Sun Rune has said, I would like to additionally submit that where the chamber intends to make some secondary use of the confession, for example, to somehow link the biography or the confession to the accused to attempt to do that, then in keeping with this approach of extreme caution, I would like to submit that where the chamber intends to make some secondary use of the confession, for example, to somehow link the biography or the confession to the accused to attempt to do that, then in keeping with this approach of extreme caution, a competent individual, that is someone with proven knowledge and understanding of the document, should come into court, should come into court and be subject to examination. Uh, very quickly moving on to A7, DK Commerce Records. It seems to me that nearly all, if not all, of these documents appear to be relevant to the communication structure and we're quite happy to concede, in fact, that the DK was engaged in trade of a beneficial nature with other nations, as many of these documents appear to suggest. Category A8. So called Tramcac District Records. It is my submission that with the exception of one of these, they appear to be concerned with the treatment of targeted groups in cooperatives and security centers. That is, we submit the implementation of a policy outside the scope of case 0201. A9 is 21 prison records. Again, only a handful or a small subset of these appear relevant to administrative communication structures to other relevant issues. The remainder, again, are meant to address the implementation of policies other than those that formed the subject of this trial. Uh, moving on to A10, that's S21 confessions. That, of course, the comments I made originally with respect to torture chain material apply here. And once more, it seems only a handful appear relevant. Case 001 transcripts, category A11. I have no objections beyond the ones Major Sonarun made, general, general ones that we've made already. Again, I would note that only about a third of these appear relevant to this trial. A14, these are the site identification reports. These appear to have absolutely no relevance to this trial. I, I haven't been able to detect any. A15, Maps and photographs, these are of varied relevance. A16, this is a potentially problematic category, audio and video records. Again, some of these appear prima facie relevant, especially with respect to the historical background. But I would submit that cautious approach is needed here, especially with respect to any audio or video recordings of the accused. Who we submit has the right to confront the maker in court, the maker of those, what, the, the, the producer, I should say, of those records, of those audio and video records. And that is because a proper context may have been edited out of the recordings. We just might not know about it. So in this regard, we may, and we reserve our right to do so, to seek the admission of any unedited footage should the chamber be interested in admitting these documents. A17, A18, and A19, I've batched together. Those are the international communications, international media reports, and academic articles. Again, I would just say these appear to be very relevant. But to be perfectly clear, as we, the defense, have sought to rely on such material, I want to make it clear, we do not object to the admission of these types in any categorical sense. We don't want to suggest any double standard, and we do believe that our general objections, if implemented properly, will safeguard our rights with respect to these documents. Finally, the rogatory reports, that's category A20, and I have to submit, as we've consistently done since the start of the trial, that any material generated by the OCIJ must be handled with extreme caution. 
they submit and this is due to what we have submitted was a biased and otherwise flawed approach to the judicial investigation. And in this regard, I simply make reference to our previous objections, our preliminary objections, where we extensively briefed this issue. And that takes me to the end of the prosecution's documents. I'll very, very briefly move on to Young Series. There's only one document tabled for discussion today. That's the book by Michael Vickery. Cambodia, 1975-1982. We, of course, have no objection to that document being placed on the record. Uh, that's D22-1.17. We would, of course, as we've indicated before, prefer to hear Mr. Vickery as a witness in conjunction with this, with his book being used as evidence. And I reiterate that request today. Uh, finally, not quite finally, but in terms of the last group, I'm looking now at the Q Sampan Annex. And again, as, as, as was the case with the Yang Seri documents, we have no general objections as such to this material to support our colleagues. We do would like to, we would like to make one caveat with respect to four of the documents on this list, and I'll just quickly read those. The first is D210-5, and I'm reading from the French E109-1.1, that's all I've got is the French. This seems to be a transcription of an interview with Uk Bunchion on the 14th of August 1990 with Steve Hedder. Uk Bunchion, of course, is a CPP senator who refused to appear before the OCIJ pursuant to a summons. Next document is listed as RI 19.58, and that's identified as a interview with Kim Chun. DC Cam. She, of course, is a suspect in case four. Third document, IS, uh, RI, excuse me, 21.74, telegram of Mayas Mut, Mayas Mut, of course, is suspect in case three. And finally, RI 19.51. And that is an interview with Horan M. Hong. Again, obviously, the RGC Minister of Foreign Affairs, who refused to appear before the OCIJ pursuant to a validly issued summons. With respect to these four documents, we submit that given that political interference is a key issue in this case, these documents should not be admitted without the authors appearing in court for examination by the Chamber and the parties. One note on the further hearings, we, we've been informed that the discussion of the so-called new documents will be scheduled in uh, due course, and as notified in the same E171-2-5. Uh, and I mention this because I'm confused slightly on, on a point. We, we would like an additional indication as to whether and when we can expect to make substantive submissions as to the probative value of the various documents that we've been discussing these last few weeks. And I'm talking about, of course, what we're dealing with today, what we've dealt with in the past, not the new documents. We would like some indication when, whether, how it's going to look like. We're going to have a debate on the probative value not just the admissibility. And finally, uh, last, last point I'd like to make today, I'd just like to note that after the close of the last session, there was an attempted escalation by Hun Sen with respect to document E-176, and that, of course, is our application for summary action against the Prime Minister for his remarks that our client is a deceitful killer and a perpetrator of genocide. In late February, it was reported that Hun Sen was considering retaliatory legal action against an individual he described as an arrogant member of the Nguyen Chia defense team. So in disposing of E-176, we do urge the chamber to take this into account, to take the prime minister's latest position, which can only be construed as an inappropriate threat, into account. In our submission, such thuggish behavior is to be condemned, and we hereby request the chamber to do so. And you may consider this to be a new request 
pursuant to Rule 35 for some reaction against the Prime Minister as it is based on new information. And that's all I have for today. I gladly cede the balance of our time to Mr. Karnavas. Thank you very much. No, Your Honor, we're, we've concluded. Thank Good afternoon, Mr. President. Good afternoon, Your Honors, and good afternoon to everyone in, in the round of court room. Uh, yes, indeed, we do have some, uh, some remarks concerning the various types of documents that are being sought to be admitted by the uh, the prosecution and the civil uh, I'll begin with some general remarks, uh, Mr. President, and then I'll go through each category. It is impossible to go through every single document that we uh, object to, so I will just do it uh, by topic. And on occasion, I will bring some uh, examples to, so that you can all see what exactly I'm referring to. Suffice it to say, it is our fundamental position and our starting point that the prosecution is attempting to try its case by and large without any witnesses by simply admitting the documents, documents which come under topics that not always are representative of what exactly is in the bundle of documents. In fact, I would say that it occurs to such a degree of frequency that one has to question the motives and per perhaps even the professional ethics behind that. So, for instance, if you are submitting a biography and a biography is a statement, a statement is not a biography, it is a statement of a witness. Or if you are, for instance, trying to introduce a rogatory report, the report contains summary of statements. Uh, that's another clear indicator. Our position is that, of course, as indicated by the Nunchia team, that anything, any documents that go to the acts and conducts of the accused uh, cannot be admitted and should not be admitted without uh, viva voce testimony, without a witness. Being being uh, the uh, on numerous occasions, uh, in fact, on every occasion that it can think of, cites the jurisprudence of ICTY. Of and that is exactly the jurisprudence of ICTY. So in this instance, at least we are in the same mindset that where uh, any statements, any summaries, anything that may go to the acts of conducts of the accused, unless the witness uh, comes in to be subjected to cross-examination, uh, that material cannot and should not be admitted. Now, let me begin by going through some of the Categories of documents. I will start off with the uh, biographies. And there may be some repetition, some repetition from what we heard from the noon chair team. I will try to edit as I go along my thoughts and what I feel, what I've prepared to present to the trial chamber so as not to, uh, to repeat what has already been said. And in order that there not be any misunderstandings, let me begin by saying we adopt the positions that have been advocated thus far by the Nunchia team. In other words, we find everything that they've indicated, both factually and legally, uh, to be correct, and that we adopt that position, and we incorporate it into our remarks. Now, 
biographies we submit in addition to being taken under conditions which would amount to torture tainted evidence are in fact statements. There are unsworn statements provided under dubious circumstances where the authors are unavailable and are, uh, cannot be confronted. So our position is that these biographies should not be admitted. Many of the biographies, for example, D366-7.1 or D366-7.1.14 state that they are prisoner biographies. Any biographies derived from torture-tainted material must not be admitted. So, so they, they, the, the biographies themselves indicate they are, that they are from prisoners. Not biographies written by individuals who are applying for a job as if they were submitting a CV or were merely recounting as part of the self-criticism process that might have been going on at the time as to what they might have been doing. Some biographies appear to be relevant to case 002-1, but only if Ing Tirit was still in the case. In other words, he had not been severed from the case. And one example is D366-7.1.14. I raise this, and I think this is something that at some point, the trial chamber may need to grapple with, and perhaps now is the time to plant the seed that there may be instances where uh, evidence may be relevant to Ing Tirit, but since she is not in this case any longer, the question is to what extent such evidence should come in, and if it does come in, would it in any way impact the rights of the other accused? Or are we to then be in a position where perhaps uh, uh, we are acting as her defense. Uh, that's something that I raised at this point in time. I leave it up to your honors to think about it. But at some point, I think there may be some evidence which might need to be addressed or excluded or admitted subject to discussions as to whether it would be fair to the accused to have such evidence admitted knowing that Interit is no longer in the case. Or well, at least in 002-1. Some of the documents numbered uh, numbers uh, listed as biographies have multiple documents with the same number in English on the case file. Some of these documents appear to be biographies, but others actually appear to be DC cam interviews or summaries of biographies made by unknown authors or photographs from the DC cam publication. An example of these include IS 19.46. IS 19.157 and IS 3.5. We submit the documents which are not actually biographies but must not be listed as such. There should, not be, there should be no attempt to sneak them in as biographies. Uh, for instance, if you look at one document, 19.46, we have here what appears to be a document dated 10 October 2003, and it's an interview. It's from D.C. Camp. How can it possibly be a biography when, in fact, 
It is a question and answer statement. It's in the end. Perhaps it is an oversight. But along with this document, there are biographies which may or may not necessarily be relevant. But in any event, I think it is up to the prosecution to demonstrate why every one of these biographies is necessary. It appears that the burden is being shifted onto the defense to have to establish why this material should not be admitted when it should be the other way around. It should not be up to the defense to look through every single document and see that some are mischaracterized. Perhaps there's a good explanation from the prosecution as to why this is a biography why they title it as a biography uh, and how it may be relevant to the case. Uh, one document, D366-7.1, is an autobiography of witness TCW-724. This was translated by TC Cam. It should not be admitted unless and perhaps until the witness testifies. That's one of our other general objections. If documents are related to witnesses who are scheduled to appear, then those documents should not be admitted at this point in time until the witness appears. If, for instance, at some point we learn that the witness is unable to appear, then, of course, nothing prevents the prosecution from making an additional submission as to why now documents related to a potential witness who did not show up should be admitted in the, in the interest of justice. So we would submit as one of our other general comments that any document that's related to a witness which is currently scheduled by the trial chamber should not be admitted. When the witness comes, if it is necessary, they can then try to admit the document. But we would submit that as a matter of course, if the witness is here and is testifying, the best evidence comes from the witness's mouth. It may be necessary to present a document to the witness for the purposes of explaining or expanding or supporting what the witness says. But a statement given by a witness should not come in if the witness is testifying. Unless, of course, segments of it could come in where the witness is now being impeached by the very same document which the witness produced, or the document is being used to rehabilitate the witness if, his, uh, if he was challenged on cross-examination. But simply to say, well, isn't that what you said in your statement? You use the statement as a basis of bolstering the weight of the witness's testimony. We submit that's improper, which is another reason why we think at this point in time we submit that any documents related to witnesses who are scheduled to testify should not be admitted. And if they do not testify, then the, then the prosecution can make a further submission as to why in the interest of justice uh, that uh, those documents should be admitted. And incidentally, Your Honors, this is the procedure normally, or generally I should say, applied at the other ad hoc tribunals. So I'm not uh, that far off of what is normally the practice. And I'm not suggesting something that is not being done elsewhere. I'm not saying something that is so unique, so avant-garde, that uh, perhaps we would be uh, improvising beyond the scope of, the, of, this, of these proceedings. Uh, some documents, and in particular one, I think, uh, are not translated. This is D2-15.26. It is our opinion 
we are of the opinion, I should say, that it hasn't been translated. We cannot find the ink, uh, this document in English, and therefore uh, the document should not be uh, admitted and unless it is translated. Is that important? Obviously, I'm sure efforts are being made to have it translated. Um, if it's an oversight, then perhaps uh, the prosecution can look into all of the documents. Presumably, they've gone through every single one and can articulate with precision as to why each document that they've listed in their annex is actually relevant to 002-1. Therefore, we look forward to their explanations on this particular document and others as well. Now let me move on to uh, documents dealing with commerce records. And I won't be long on this one. Uh, basically, it is our position that we leave it to the trial chamber's discretion. Uh, to go through these documents and determine uh, whether they wish to have them admitted and whether they are actually relevant. So we leave it to your discretion. Uh, any documents dealing with commerce, other, there may be other, other parties that may have objections to these documents. Uh, our position is we leave it to your wise discretion. Excuse me. The next set of documents, Your Honor, deal with the Tram Cock District Records. And perhaps I will start with my <coughs> by remarking that there's credible evidence on the file thus far that these records, these documents, the original ones, were lost, that they were lost by <coughs> Professor Kiernan, and perhaps he's not to blame, but nonetheless, he took the documents, the original ones, then supposedly uh, gave them back to someone in the Ministry of Interior, and there is no recollection of it. There, is, there are some documents that we have. Uh, there was an interview taken of Mr. Chang, who described his knowledge of the documents and what he learned from Mr. Kiernan. There are some, there are some correspondence in the file between Professor Kiernan and the co-investigative judges where he articulates his position that he had turned over the documents, the original ones, and it was years later, I believe nearly 10 years later, that he learned that they had actually, the originals were actually lost. Uh, he did indicate that he had made copies. And, uh, and so, in any event, I leave it up to your honors to determine uh, what to make of that. Suffice it to say, uh, should, should it be necessary to hear evidence on this, Mr. Yu Cheng can be recalled, and of course, any, uh, with respect to these documents, uh, and what may, have happened, what may have happened to the original ones. Uh, if this issue is, is an important one, perhaps Mr. Kiernan can address it uh, were he to appear uh, as a witness in this case. Now, with respect to some of these documents, uh, it is our submission that not all of them appear to be actually relevant to, two, to 0021, at least when you look at the annex and you look at the uh, paragraphs to which are being cited. For example, D15.3 is, is listed as relevant to treatment of targeted groups, paragraphs 205 to 215, 
of the closing order. Uh, tram cooperatives, paragraphs 302 to my apologies for the pronunciation, How Mr. President. Le Security Centers, paragraphs 489 to 515. And to our understanding, unless we are mistaken, to our understanding, none of these paragraphs are listed as part of case 002 slash 01. And I do understand and I do appreciate the constant refrain we hear from the prosecution that some of this is contextual. Obviously, we're going to be spilling into some other areas that may touch upon 0, 0, 0, 2, 2, 0, 2, or 3, or what have you. But be that as it may, we simply point out that when you look at what is being represented by the prosecution on its face, it appears to be outside. Uh, case if, for instance, the treatment of targeted groups is not to be discussed during this trial, then why is there an attempt to bring that information in? Of course, we know the prosecution's position. They seem to be of the opinion, or at least, uh, they suspect, if I could, uh, if, if I'm interpreting what they've indicated in their past pleadings, but they suspect that there will not be another case other than this one. And therefore, perhaps this is an attempt to get all of the evidence in that they think might assist them for the entire, uh, for the entire case, even though it has been severed. And as, in, as was indicated by the Nunchia team, we are of the opinion that we submit that only documents that are strictly relevant should be admitted for this case. When we get to the next case, then they'll have an opportunity to admit those documents in. But if we're going to manage this case and try to finish it within a reasonable period of time, and in doing so, summarize the evidence, both testimonial and documentary, in a manageable fashion, then I submit, Your Honors, now is the time to be vigilant in admitting only documents that are strictly relevant. Now, some of these trim doc documents, for example, D157.16, and D157.35, appear to be summaries of confessions. And, of course, ສຸນຸກເມຕະວີອັນຈົ່ງ the two documents, I I'll start again, is D157.16 and D157.35. They appear to be summaries of confessions, which is and as such should be inadmissible for the same reason as we hear articulated both orally and, and in written form as torture tainted evidence. And as you well know, Your Honors, this matter has been briefed and you have even uh, made some rulings on the matter. Another example is D1. 5.7.86. Uh, this document is illegible, and it is our understanding that it was unable to be translated into English because the original Khmer could not be understood by the translators. So our position is this document should not even be on the case file. And of course, if we are, if I'm making any uh, misstatements or errors, I apologize, but this is our understanding. We had to go through a lot of documents in a very short period of time. Uh, 
Your Honor, I see. Uh, may I have Lord. some guidance as to when we will be breaking for the afternoon? So I, I know. I'm afraid I'm confused over the time. But man, die. They start to jump. Do you mean can you just jump to the pay bill? Yeah. That that pay is pay some rent. Like that. Ah, good friend. Look, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Chairman, 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 Mr.